if you had told me in 2018, like, hey, you know what? If you change your diet, like, it's going to like 360 your mental health. Yeah, I would, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, from from the time I was even very young, I had paralyzing anxiety. I mean, it affected every aspect of my life, and I was constantly kind of searching for things outside of my own self to make me feel good about myself. And I felt like when I was, when I changed how I ate, I, I was able to deal with life appropriately. Like, when, cause stress is, like you said, stress is gonna happen. So, and you want stress, stress can, can be a very good thing. But I just felt like I would crumble. Like I couldn't handle situations. I would call out of work with panic attacks. I was, you know, as a young person, I was married and divorced. I was financially broke. I had made a lot of really poor decisions. And once I, was eating in a way that I felt like really aligned with my own human physiology, everything changed in my life. Hey friends, welcome back. So today's show with Michelle Hearn is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition. As you can tell, we're talking a lot about metabolic health, the importance of muscle and healthy blood sugar, as well as exercise performance. And a great tool to help you with your exercise sessions are the novel creatine containing electrolyte sticks by Myoscience. We now have an unflavored version for those of you purists out there that features Crea Pure creatine from Germany, as well as red mineral salt, taurine, potassium, magnesium. And this is a phenomenal way to help in a caffeine free delivery system, support your exercise session. You can use this pre-workout or intra-workout or post-exercise because it turns out that creatine is best absorbed around exercise. Now, you can read some of the many reviews. There's close to 700 reviews over at myoscience.com where people are using this around exercise and noticing a benefit because not many companies out there have actually paired electrolytes with creatine. It turns out that electrolytes help with creatine absorption. Creatine helps with supporting healthy hydration. So you too can optimize your exercise performance as well as hydration by going to myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com and be sure to use the code podcast to save at checkout. Now today's show with Michelle, we talk a lot about nutrition. We talk a lot about preventing age-related muscle loss known as sarcopenia and how athletes can benefit from a lower carb diet and strategically utilizing carbohydrates to optimize performance during competitions as opposed to just carb loading with pasta and bread the night before a session. So I really hope you'll enjoy this session with Michelle. She has a great book called The Dietitian's Dilemma. She's been a dietitian for her entire professional career and saw a lot of holes and challenges with mainstream dietetics. And in 2019, she changed her own personal health and then changed her career path to help obese people as well as metabolically challenged people recover and restore their health with whole real foods as well as exercise. So let's get back to it with Michelle. What was your story in getting you into the more high protein, more animal based? Oh yeah, I have a good story. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I was a very high carb athlete for mm -hmm. most of my life. I, you know, obviously, um, you know, I had a very serious eating disorder when I was twelve years old. I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. I was almost five feet tall and fifty seven and a half pounds. Whoa. So I actually passed out in school. I woke up in a hospital and, you know, it wasn't too long before I was in inpatient treatment for two months. Um, you know, was put on the 24 hour tube feeding system, had to eat the standard American diet and I did become weight restored. You know, obviously that experience saved my life, but even as a 12 year old, I was told like, Hey, you're probably going to always deal with racing thoughts around food, severe anxiety, bouts of depression. And they weren't wrong. You know, mm. I suffered with that throughout my entire adolescence. Um, I did become an athlete. And I got into long distance running uh, when I was younger and I just, I found I had a knack for it. Like I went to the state meet and, um, but unfortunately, you know, had some injuries left over from, you know, low bone density from mm -hmm. having anorexia. Uh, but yeah, after college, I went into marathon training and of course, you know, the traditional advice is just to consume massive amounts of carbohydrates. And so I did, you know, I ate, um, when I was training really hard, it wasn't uncommon to eat. 350 to 400 grams of carbs a day, sometimes more. Um, I was that person that had to eat every two hours. You know, I would get dizzy and shaky if I went too long without eating. Certainly after running, I could get very like dizzy. Um, but it wasn't until 2019 that I really made a big health switch. And I, I, I was eating, you know, I've always eaten meat, you know, grew up in Texas, but it was a relatively small part of my diet, you know, and have some chicken, maybe beef once or twice a week. And in 2019, I was trying to qualify for the Olympic trials in the marathon. Mm. And at that time, females had to run under two hours and 48 minutes. I believe they've dropped the standard to 243 now. 
and I'd run two hours and 54 minutes. So I was training really hard and it just felt like overnight, like my performance kind of fell off a cliff. I, I remember going for a run and about two miles into the run, I started feeling kind of dizzy and shaky and I thought, oh my God, I, I must be getting, I must be getting sick. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't and I wasn't recovering. I, my muscles were hurting. My back was hurting, you know, go to the doctor, get all of the tests done. Everything's fine. Um, <laughs> I think my wife would tell you I was extra short during this time. I actually remember driving to an event. I just broke out in a cold sweat and, uh, finally had my kind of what I call my like come to Jesus moment when I, I was working in Portland at a hospital at the time as the dietitian, and I, I floated, meaning I got to work in several areas and I was working on oncology and we had a younger patient pass. So I came home early, actually fell asleep on the couch and I woke up and it just felt like my body was on fire mm -hmm. and I was out of answers. You know, I had done everything I knew that my dietitian education said to be a healthy human, you know, eating all these whole grains, eating all these fruits and vegetables. Um, at that point I was taking, you know, ibuprofen medications. I tried alcohol. I tried wheat. I tried everything yeah. and nothing was working. So I remember standing in the kitchen and being like, I don't know what to do. And so at two in the morning, I drove to 7-Eleven and got 30 pounds of ice and put it in the bathtub. I'm sitting in this ice bath, just crying. And my wife comes in and is like, you know, maybe we should do something different. And I was like, yes, I'm done running. I'm mm -hmm. never running again. This is stupid. I was 36 at the time. I'm not going to be a marathon runner. I may not, I'd never run. Like, who cares? Um, and of course, you know, it's so interesting. Those, those, sometimes those times in our lives when you just feel like everything is falling apart. I had no idea that that would be a pivotal turning moment in my life. Um, I knew intuitively that all these carbohydrates were not making me feel well, you know, but I didn't just connect it just to how deeply um, damaging they were for me. Um, and so, you know, I knew like, okay, I'm not running anymore. Why don't I try a ketogenic diet? Mm. And as I was researching a ketogenic diet, I stumbled on the carnivore diet and I thought like, wow, this could be a really great tool to use. I could just do this, you know, for 30 days, get a lot of protein. And of course, you know, <laughs> my, par my partner was not thrilled with this idea. Hey, this is eating disorder. This will only set you back. Um, and I can't even tell you why. I was just so convinced that I needed to do this. Hmm. And as I started, you know, eating, <laughs> first of all, I was still working at the hospital with the other dietitian. So, you know, in the morning, everyone has their oatmeal and bagels and I come in with my pound of ground beef. <laughs> They're like, well, this is different. Mm. Um, but I remember we were in a meeting about a week in and my coworker was kind of shaky. She's like, oh, I got to get a snack. And I was like, Christy, we're going to, we're going to eat at noon. Yeah. And she goes, Michelle, it's almost two. And I can't tell you the last time I'd gone like six hours without eating. For the first time in my life, my blood sugar was actually stable. Mm. I also noticed I was calm. You know, I, I think we really underestimate, you know, most people think, oh, ground beef or steak, they think protein, but we underestimate just how crucial those vitamins, minerals, and cofactors are. And when I say that, I'm talking about folate and B12 and carnitine and tarring, all those things that your brain needs to work properly. I felt like for the first time in my life, I was calm. Mm. Um, and also my muscles didn't hurt, but I kind of attributed that Well, I'm not running. And then finally at like the three week point of doing this, of doing the all meat diet, um, I actually came home and my wife was sitting on the couch and she's like, Hey, I need to talk to you. And if anyone's in a relationship, you know, that's not a usually scary. a good thing. That's like, Oh no, am I in trouble? Did someone die? And I went and sat with her and she said, I don't know if I like this diet but this is the best your anxiety has been in the 11 years that I've known you. Wow. And so we both just sat there and were like, what is going on? And so, you know, we spent the next, and she's a scientist. She's very smart. Mm -hmm. um, several, what aspect of science is she in? Um, she oversees like um, pathology, like blood bank tissue. So just cool. like looking at different samples to diagnose things. Nice. Um, super nerdy, very, yeah. very cute. Um, yeah, but we were like, okay, is there research behind this? What, what, are, what have we missed? Because clearly I'm doing the opposite of what I was taught as a dietitian. Mm -hmm. Like I was genuinely scared. Like, oh my God, am I going to have no energy? Is my heart going to explode? And I felt the best I'd ever had in my life. And I was also seeing images and examples of people on you know, social media that were doing this. And as I dove into the research, and we don't have good clinical trials right now on like a carnivore type diet, but we have a ton on a ketogenic diet. 
And that's another thing I would tell people. I don't think, I don't think many people appreciate that we have thousands of clinical trials specifically on blood sugar. Like I was shocked. I had patients that I worked with that were diabetic type two for 30 years. And we had studies that we could get people off 150 units of insulin in eight days. Mm. So as I'm going through all these studies, I was just, one, I was fascinated too. I was angry because I was like, why, why aren't we doing this? Why are we not teaching people with metabolic dysfunction, which is most of the population, how quickly and efficiently they can reverse disease? Yeah, that's, it's impressive. And I mean, I think there is a lot of industry influence on the education of all health professionals, particularly dietitians. And we can dive into the American Academy of Dietetics and how food companies are paying uh, influencer dietitians to promote unhealthy junk food. Yeah. But I first want to ask your I want to ask you, like, why do you think it is now, now that you've seen the other side, you've been red pilled, so to speak. So you understand, you know, how quickly the body adapts. Mm -hmm. And just for small background and perspective, um, my story is actually quite similar as well, because I was an endurance cyclist. And this was in 2003, when I started to get into competitive cycling, wanted to be a pro and all that. And it was, it was a lot of carbs, carb yeah. loading, you know, pasta nights and dinners, even in high school football, it was like the Thursday night before a game, yeah. we'd have pizza, we'd have all this. And I remember like gastrointestinal issues in this, but you don't make the association back then because you haven't hit the reset button with like a, a keto or carnivore diet. Right. So, so I think a lot of people are just unaware how their food is impacting their overall health. But anyhow, um, once I started to transition off carbs, I similarly noticed those shakes that you would get all the time. Like if you didn't have the hammer gel, the dextrose, the maltodextrin, <laughs> like, and it's just incredible. It's like, wow, I, my energy is so much better. My recovery is better. I don't have those heavy legs. So that's a long way of saying, going back to the excellent point that you brought up is, um, why is you, you made the observation that, that our healthcare institutions and practitioners are not sort of seeing what is to us so obvious mm -hmm. as an obvious way you know there's a lot of talk about increasing access to healthcare, but not reforming like what is being you know uh, uh disseminated in healthcare in terms of the the information so do you think it's industry influence is it because the practitioners themselves haven't aren't as in tune with their health like if you could put your finger on the pulse where are we missing the boat here Gosh, I mean, that's a really good question. But I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is the industry influence. I think, you know, like you were saying, the Academy of Nutrition, which is the governing board of all dietitians who is responsible for our education, our continuing education, is heavily sponsored by processed foods. Yeah. You know, the number one sponsors, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Hershey's, General Mills. Kellogg's. Uh, yeah, and... Kellogg's, Splenda. Um, in 2021, the National Confectionery Association came on. Um, it's like, you can't make this up. And I remember having a conversation with a dietitian that said, well, Michelle, it's not like I would ever go into a room as somebody that has type two diabetes and tell them drink a Coca-Cola. And I said, well, of course you wouldn't, but that's not what they're buying. What they're buying is when you go into the room as somebody with type two diabetes and that person says, well, is it okay if I have a Coca-Cola there? What they have bought is you're, you're going to say, well, yeah, just in moderation. They have literally bought that concept of like, oh, well, I can't tell you not to, but you know, cause I'm getting sponsored by these people, but just do it in moderation where you and I both know and that it's very difficult, if not impossible to moderate processed foods. They're literally designed to override your body and brain's ability to, <laughs> to eat them in moderation. To self-regulate. Yeah, and exactly. So it's, if we had, if we took the industry um, out of it. You know, I've thought about this a lot is mm -hmm. what if we monetized health? Can you imagine how different our healthcare industry would be if, if we paid people to get them off medication, you know, kind of similar to the, the, the Verta, Verta health model. Mm -hmm. You know, I think why Dr. Finney and, and Verta health has been so successful is his model is he's literally going to insurance companies and saying, I will save you money because these people are going to be so much healthier when they follow this low carb uh, diet, when they get off their medications, when they don't need these diabetes surgeries. So if we did that nationwide, you know, we, I think we'd see a huge change, but until we actually monetize health, you know, we, we literally monetize people to be sick. Yeah. You know? Which is so unfortunate. I, I think what's unique about that aspect of, of health, speaking about the insurance companies, is the reinsurers are realizing that they are 
losing their rear on on the liabilities because people are requiring so much so many medical services because of their poor health and so they're putting emphasis on the companies that they insure so you might have like uh, think of United Healthcare. Well, they are insured by, say, Swiss Re or another reinsurer, and they are putting pressure on the healthcare providers and, and that are um, working with, say, United Healthcare patients to say, "Hey, we have to implement some lifestyle change because, like, you know, you guys are a liability for all of these people who, like you said, I th- the recent and Haynes data shows about ninety six percent of American adults ha- are metabolically unhealthy and. You know, we are, I'm now seeing this in my daughter's school. You know, I was telling you offline, the children, uh, it's not uncommon for my my daughter to come home and tell me, you know, she's been eating real food her whole life. She's never been to McDonald's or fast food, but you know, her, uh, students and her peers are, are, uh, a lunch is like Oreos and Mm -hmm. Cheez-Its and Capri Sun. Like this is not uncommon. And you have a great book we'll talk about later that's aimed to help parents and children. But, um, you know, going back to getting uh, the the industry out of the, the dietetic world, in particular, and also medicine, I think would be helpful. Um, so that is sort of the the paradigm uh, or thinking process, the set of heuristics that dietetics follow is everything in moderation. Is that it? It's like, OK, we know when soda is bad or Oreo cookies are bad, but just have one. That's kind of the, the thinking process. Yeah, we are, there's this fear that if we restrict things, if we tell people not to do something, that we are harming them, that they are going to be obsessed with wanting to do this. And, you know, we can talk about this even in the context of eating disorders. And, you know, the food model too is still very carbohydrate focused. And so it's like, well, all foods can fit, you know? And it's very interesting because we we, def- we define things, or at least the Dietetics Association defines things that are food that, in my opinion, are not food. Like Cheez-Its is not food. Oreos are not food. You know, I would say most vegetables, fruits, meats, those are food, mm. you know? And we also see this even in, um, like, our SNAP programs, our, our, our food... Um, Food stamps. Yeah, yeah. food subsidies. And I'm, you know, people get very up in arms about this. And I'm not, you know, I was on food stamps when I was a a child. But, you know, the most, um, the amount of dollars that, that, you know, people with food stamps spend, most of it goes to, to, yeah, soda is the number one thing that people purchase. So it's, we've got a big problem. You know, like you said, we have... We have a population that is metabolically unhealthy. We have a population statistically that has incredibly high blood sugar. And, you know, my opinion, my research, all my experience says a lot of disease comes from that hyperinsulinemia. People have too much, you know, blood sugar, too much carbohydrates. You know, pancreas is secreting too much insulin. And insulin's a super powerful hormone. Insulin stops your body from burning fat for fuel like that. You know, most people who are overweight, who have any type of issue, you've got to burn fat for fuel. And here we are, like you said, as dietitians being like, oh, just eat in moderation. (laughs) And most people, I don't even think, realize how many carbohydrates they have every day. I have patients I worked with that tell me like, oh, I don't eat many carbs. And you go through, okay, what do you eat for breakfast? Well, I have cereal and yogurt and a banana. (laughs) A little bit of orange juice, but not every day. Exactly. And you know, what do you eat for lunch? Like, oh, I have a sandwich. um, And, but I don't have chips. You know, it's, people don't realize just how, um, and how often, that's another thing that's really interesting to me that I think has changed a lot. You know, I remember growing up eating like three meals a day. Maybe you grabbed a snack as a kid when you got home from school. But it's like people are eating all the time. It's like they wake up, they have these sugary coffees, they have breakfast, they have a snack before lunch, they have lunch, they have another sugary coffee. It's like their poor body is constantly just being bombarded with uh, sugar and processed carbs. It's really unfortunate. I, I mean, that's why, I mean, it, it's people like yourself who have uh, seen the other side of it because mm-hmm. um, once you have overt disease and go through the mainstream healthcare system, um, the recommendations for food are just more of the same. Yes. You know, I have friends who are occupational therapists working with, and there's calls all the time with the, the patients that they're working with. It's often, Michelle, you'll think this is interesting, but very predictable, deconditioned. So these people are in their 40s, as young as 39, uh, deconditioned, meaning they're out of shape. They're diabetic, hypertensive, and oftentimes demented. And yet the food recommendations from the hospitals where they were hospitalized for fill in the blank, a fall or some sort of gastroparesis, whatever, um, they are sent home with uh, (laughs) cupcakes. I mean, it's just, it's just absurd. So we have a major problem and it seems like the solution is pretty uh, attainable for a lot of people. But I do think that eating this way does 
it, it is a little, little bit more expensive. So for the family, let's say, who is eating Oreo cookies and chips and cheeses and things from maybe even Walgreens, you know, I've been to Walgreens at night to get mouth tape and I see families unfortunately going in there and just buying, you know, a bunch of candy. Um, where, where would you recommend they start? Like just ground beef, even if it is like feedlot beef, like how do we, like if we get into the nuts and bolts about like, where do people start? What would you suggest? Yeah. I mean, that's another great question. Cause I hear that all the time. Like it's a cost issue and I definitely want to validate that. My God, food is getting really expensive. You go to the grocery store, you're like, holy cow. Um, you know, well, first I feel like it, people have to just know, I feel like so many people just don't know they can reverse their disease. Yeah. Like they just feel like, well, I'm always going to be obese or tired. Like their, their baseline of health is so poor that eating those cookies or those chips, like that could be the best part of their day. And that's another thing that's really sad. And in, in my opinion is that eating a processed food is the highlight of your day. You know, that that's where we have let a lot of our elderly and a lot of other people get to. But as far as cost goes, you know, starting with like proteins and fats. And I, I personally don't care if it's feedlot beef, feedlot beef, if it's Walmart eggs, like just starting with what you can afford, high protein, high fat foods, you know, really axing the carbohydrates is, is an excellent place to start. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's something that I think most people could do, you know, and we just don't empower people to say like, okay, instead of starting your day with pop tarts, we're going to start your day with eggs and cheese. You know, I listened to a podcast um, from a guy, same thing. He said, I just, I didn't have any money. So all I ate was eggs and cheese for like several weeks, <laughs> but it was amazing. He's like, I felt so much better. All of a sudden I started having more energy and I was actually able to come off some medications and then he was able to add some other foods back in. Um, yeah. We also have a thing in this country where if people don't eat for like a few hours, they just lose their mind. Like, oh my God, you know, it's okay also to skip meals. You know, it's okay to not eat all the time. But when you're constantly eating those carbohydrates and processed foods, if you don't eat every few hours, you're going to feel crappy, you know? So yeah, it's a catch 22, but, um, definitely starting where you can, you know, what can you afford? You know, there's, there's absolutely no reason you have to get the grass finished grass, you know, fed, whatever beef and eggs, if you can't afford it. Right. And for people that have been on a, on a low carb or carnivore diet, you know, some of the people that I've worked with, uh, tend to get bored over time, sure. you know? And so how do you introduce the novelty? So it doesn't get bored. I have my ideas, but I would love to know as a dietitian, your suggestions for keeping it spicy, keeping it novel. <laughs> do you slowly introduce maybe some f soaked rice or do you like, uh, how do you, yeah. How do you work around that? Yeah. So I think, you know, I'm definitely one of those people that is, I'm, I'm not a good cook at all. I'm very, I'm okay. Like very, very basic being a little bit boring. My wife is a much, much better cook and it craves more creativity than I do. But once you're metabolically healthy, you know, I've seen people do a low carb or very low carb or carnivore diet for a while. And then they're able to successfully introduce some plants. You know, I, I am not anti-plant or anti-carbohydrate at all. I think most metabolically healthy people can tolerate between 50 and 100 grams of carbohydrates just fine. But like you stated earlier, 96% of us are not healthy. Mm -hmm. So it's like once you get to that point, you know, once you get to a point where, and it's different for everybody, you know, it might be different for somebody if you're, you know, you have super high A1C or type 2 diabetic, it might be a while before you're introducing any type of like, you know, starchy carbohydrate. But yeah, I personally, um, we do some soaked rice, we do some long fermented sourdough. Um, you know, we both live in the Pacific Northwest, so we actually uh, grow some carrots. There's uh, in the summer, there's wild berries, blueberries that we um, we consume. So I think I think it's important to make it sustainable. You know, I think saying like I'm only going to eat this for the rest of my life. I, I don't know. Your mind kind of immediately goes like, oh no, <laughs> and starts starts wondering. So. Um, and also just being, being creative with, with spices and things. Like one thing I've noticed is we, we don't really teach basic life skills anymore. Um, and even when I was in high school, it's like, you know, we don't teach people how to cook or how to change a tire, or how to communicate effectively or how to not get a credit card with 25% interest, you know? So, um, just basic learning some basic skills on how to cook spices, things like that. Are amazing. I mean, th this should be what families focus on, not uh, giving kids phones and just babysitting with TikTok or whatever the thing <laughs> is. Yeah. So I definitely like to have my daughter go to the grocery store with me, pick, help pick out food and then get her involved in the cooking process yes. and, and the gardening process as well. I garden as well. So we have beets and carrots and tomatoes and um, zucchini, cucumber, all, all of those things. And like when things are in season, like we're consuming those, you know, and, and preparing them in a way to minimize the anti-nutrient load and pulling out the seeds and all that. But um, 
are you making your own bread or is this just something that you buy the long sourdough? We, we make it. Yeah. Cool. My wife makes it. It's, it's a, it's, we've had the starter for a long time now, but yeah. And it takes, it's a, it's a several day process, but, um, it's amazing how much one better it is. And then, you know, obviously, you know, when you're fermenting things, you're, um, you're minimizing the anti-nutrients. It's amazing. I mean, my brother's really into this. I, tried to get into it in the spring. There's several books on it. And it for me to get the mother culture going, I, I kept having it get moldy. I don't know. I, I need to go back and watch some other videos, but it is a cool thing. And it's a novelty too. Like mm -hmm. we have backyard chickens bringing the, the eggs to people's houses at their hosting dinner. Yeah. But I can imagine, you know, bringing your own sourdough bread would be, and that's bread, you know, that people eat in Europe all the time. And they don't have the level of uh, metabolic ill health that we do here in the U.S. You know, so I, I do think... I like your approach of like, hey, we can, once you restore your metabolic health, it's okay to slowly reintroduce some of these foods based upon your activity level or health risks and things like that. Now, Michelle, this might sound like a, an elementary question. Uh, we have a relatively advanced audience, but um, I think it's good to tackle the basics. What do you, what are the blood tests or ways that you would sort of ascertain metabolic health and to ensure people are trending on the right path? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that immediately comes to my mind is like, like just a basic CBG panel, right? We want to see what is your blood glucose? Um, what are your like electrolytes? But interestingly, you know, blood glucose can be, um, cause it's just a snapshot, right? So A1C obviously is a big one. You know, we want to make sure that people's A1C, um, isn't in the diabetic range, which you and I were talking about now it's, they're saying <laughs> if you're under seven, you're okay. And we would argue that's not ideal. Um, you know, if you are able to get, and these are something that doctors don't necessarily talk about, but I think a fasting insulin mm -hmm. is a really good one. And one thing that's nice now though, is there are labs, um, you can even just get online and order lab tests. You know, you can pay for them out of pocket and they're not terribly expensive. I, I often do that for, for ferritin for, you know, my running, but yeah, I would say certainly want um, your A1C fasting insulin. Um, I'm always curious about triglycerides. You know, you want to see your HDL, LDL, but people tend to freak out when they see high LDL. All doctors, or I shouldn't say all, most doctors, they see a high um, LDL and they're like, oh my gosh, heart disease, statin, where, you know, we know in the context of a low carbohydrate diet, you know, high LDL is not dangerous. So, but it also needs to be in context. You know, obviously if you're, you have a very high one, say high blood glucose, high triglycerides, high LDL is dangerous. So those are kind of the main ones that, that come to my mind. Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned and underscored the importance of triglycerides. I think a lot of people, and most mainstream doctors generally, at least up to now, hitherto, have really kind of ignored the importance of high triglycerides. And I have found them to be a reliably uh, in, indicative biomarker of metabolic health. You know, mm -hmm. the, the people that uh, are carbohydrate intolerant, um, eating a lot of processed foods, generally their triglycerides are well over 100, you know, and yeah, they might be on a statin because their cholesterol was also high, but the recommendation to go on a low carb diet, uh, which is really effective, I found to lower blood triglycerides. And so I think that's, um, at least there's more and more research coming out with hypertriglyceridemia and the risk for cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality. And, and I think that's important. Um, continuous glucose monitors. I think this has been a great tool over the past several years. You know, people have been using these. What have you found in terms of using those clinically with some of these more at risk populations? Does it help people kind of tether, you know, make the realization that these pro the processed foods are jacking up their blood sugar and does it help instill lifestyle change you think? Well, unfortunately, I would say most of the people, I mean, you know, having worked, I worked in the clinical setting for 11 years and I don't think I ever saw somebody with the CGM, you know, mm. they're, they tended to be at least, um, you know, when I was in practice, very, well, first of all, they were newer then, but discouraged like, oh, if you, if you're not, you know, type one diabetic, you don't need these. Um, but what I have seen in people that have used them is that they're fantastic. They give you feedback in real time because it's one thing for me to tell a patient maybe that has, you know, type two diabetes, like, Hey, even when you eat oatmeal, your blood sugar is going to go up. But then when they see it, they're like, wow, look at that. And then when they see, um, like, wow, I just ate eggs and it was, that line was just, you know, it didn't go up at all. Or, you know, they get to see the numbers. So, uh, I mean, I think those can be really great. And it's also been interesting to see individually how some people react differently to even the same food, you know, mm. where like maybe a fruit in somebody gives a much higher rise in blood sugar to one person than the other. So I think, I think those can be great tools. 
Yeah, I mean, instead of subsidizing Oreos, maybe we could <laughs> subsidize continuous glucose, glucose monitors, which would be incredible. But I like that you mentioned the other factors in the inter-individuality there, even a poor night's sleep. I mean, I found when I was wearing my CGM back in 2017 for the first time, um, a stressful situation like going, I was late in Toronto going through security and they don't honor TSA pre or anything like that. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss my flight, miss my flight. They have all these like cutoff times sure. that are much more strict here than, than uh, in Canada compared to the U.S., and and my glucose went up to like 160. And so for me, I was like, okay, you know, I'm low carb, but stressful situations are going to jack up my glucose. And so I need to then focus on maybe not being so, so much of a zealot about carbohydrate intake, but managing stress with breath work, meditation, things like that. So yeah, I love the personalization aspect there, which I think is great. But going back to the American Diabetes Association, recent recommendation that the target hemoglobin A1C should be under 7%. Was, this was, this is not fake news. This no, is this real. Is, this is real. This happened. Um, yeah. And I, in interestingly, the um, American Diabetes Association, I thought this was a joke, so I had to actually look it up, but their, their motto, their slogan is connected for life. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> yes. So, the only explanation I have, and I've seen this, you know, um, talking with other dietitians when I used to work in the hospital, is they were having, it was basically a complete failure to get anybody's A1C under seven on a consistent carbohydrate diet, you know, which is what they recommend for a lot of people with type two diabetes and a consistent carbohydrate diet being, all right, you're going to eat 60 grams of carbs at breakfast, 15 for a snack, 60 at lunch, 15 for a snack. So basically we're going to dose you with relatively consistently amounts of carbohydrates throughout the day and then dose you with insulin. And in my experience, that has been a total failure. And obviously it makes sense. You know, it's like, how are we going to improve somebody's blood sugar um, by giving them more sugar <laughs> like, and then just dosing them with medication? And like we talked about earlier, insulin is a powerful hormone that, you know, suppress not only suppresses fatty acid oxidation, but people just don't realize like if you have type two diabetes and you eat carbohydrates and you take insulin to get it out of your bloodstream, it doesn't just go into a magical universe. You know, people will be like, oh, you know, my, my blood sugar went down. It's like, where do you think this goes? <laughs> it has to go somewhere. And if you have two, type two diabetes, it's like that, that show, the hoarders, like there's no room left in the end. It gets stored as fat, you know? And depending on your genetics, it can get stored as either subcutaneous or visceral fat. And visceral fat is very dangerous. You know, that's why type 2 diabetics have a two to four fold um, increased risk for heart disease. But anyway, just going back to 7%, I'm sorry, a, a 7 for A1C, we know that damage takes place even, even at 6.5, 6.7%. You know, we're, we're actually seeing damage happen. And when I say, when, when I say damage, I'm, I'm meaning that um, when you have, when your blood sugar is high, that shifts the pH of your blood. And when that shifts the pH of your blood, I mean, your body really wants to keep things, you know, um, level. And what it can do is it starts to damage the arterial walls. And that's why people with type 2 diabetes, um, they start having peripheral neuropathy. They can't feel their feet. They start to have glaucoma. You know, all these arteries are being damaged. And so for the organization, the American Diabetes Association, that is supposed to be advocating and protecting people and helping them get better, to have a recommendation that we know still causes damage is, in my opinion, pretty awful. Yeah, it's almost as though they're throwing in the towel, realizing that like most people are not going to get to that level anyway. So let's give them, let's just lower the bar potentially, yeah. which is uh, really wild. I, I don't know the conflicts of interest with the American Diabetes Association, but I, I have followed uh, on Instagram. There's like local, like Wisconsin ADA or mm -hmm. American Diabetes Association, and and they're often doing like food drives or events, and you and they they post a picture like, look at us, come to exhibit whatever. And it's honestly, it's, it's the Fritos and Chips Ahoy and everything like that. So it's, it's pretty uh, astounding that um, these institutions are recommending these unhealthy foods. But um, getting back to the concern here, some people have with regards to protein. So mm -hmm. we've established that hyperpalatable junk food raises blood glucose and insulin, which is problematic. Yes. We want people to eat more whole, feel, whole foods, protein-based, you know, uh, vegetables and, and avocado and, and healthy whole real foods, fruits and so forth there's a fear that protein gets converted to glucose and may drive blood sugar imbalances. How realistic of a concern is that for most people, would you say? <laughs> I would say for most people, that's like 
negative concern. <laughs> like that, that is not, that should not be a concern. Like I have never, you know, in all my time as a dietitian, I've never seen somebody with type two diabetes. And I was like, you know, it's the protein N- never. And I've never seen somebody consuming, you know, a lot of people have reversed their diabetes by eating a relatively high protein diet, you know, um, not necessarily even a ketogenic diet, which is higher in fat. Um, protein is incredibly satiating protein. Um, like we talked about earlier, it's not just the, the amino acids, the the protein. Um, but it also is all those different cofactors that comes with it. So, and you know, just getting back to once again, like very simple common sense as humans evolved eating meat and fat, like that's how, that's how our brains grew. That's how we went from, you know, uh, from being on all fours to bipedal. Um, so we are, our bodies are, designed to very effectively utilize that nutrition. And so, you know, I think if we flipped, you know, how our carbohydrate ratio and ate, you know, 300 grams of protein, that might be a little excessive, but if we did that and ate a lot less carbs, we'd certainly be a a lot healthier society. I agree with that. And I I like that you mentioned a little bit more about like mental health and your wife noticed that once you started eating more protein, less carbs, that you were more even energetically. Um, And from a mindset perspective, I I do think there's ample evidence to suggest that vegans and vegetarians suffer from mental health issues at a a much higher rate than the general omnivorous population. Um, And in your estimation, is this because the, the dearth of micronutrients in a vegan or vegetarian diet, or is it the high carbohydrate intake or a combination of that? And how can we reach that population to help them better understand that their diet is linked to their mental health? Oh, man, that is a great question because, you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's people, in my experience, a lot of vegan and vegetarian can be very, very triggered when you, when you mention, you know, they immediately say like, it's because of animals or the planet. Um, (laughs) But when it comes to mental health, you know, your, your brain needs certain nutrients you know, specifically what I really worry about with vegans specifically, um, DHA, especially for brain health, especially in those very early years, you know, your, your, the body needs DHA that's only available in animal products, you know, and, and some vegans have come back and said like, Oh, well, what about, you know, alpha poke acid, which can convert to, you know, DHA or whatever. And it's like, gosh, the ratio of that is so incredibly small. And, to get enough nutrition on a a vegan diet is incredibly difficult. Can it be done? Absolutely. We have lots of examples of that, but you have to buy supplements. You have to be very specific. You have to be genetically okay. Cause you know, we know 45% of the population can actually convert um, plant vitamin A to usable performed vitamin A. So and what polymorphism would that be if people are doing their ancestry? I, I'm not familiar with the, are we talking like um, the retinol? Yeah, they can't actually, they're not, yeah, it's it's really interesting. There's a good paper on this I can send to you, but sure. yeah, and you know, a lot of people that have had like severe acne and some other things, um, when they start eating like animal sources of vitamin A, like liver, um, like some, uh, gosh, what else is vitamin A? I'm blanking now other than liver, but they do amazingly well. I think egg yolk has some, um, of the performed vitamin A. Mm-hmm. Um, but even like, you know, the, the K vitamins, D vitamins, like they're just so much better absorbed in the, in the, um, you know, animal form. And when you're eating a vegan diet, you're getting so much phytic acid. I think phytic acid is something we don't talk enough about. Um, and what that is, is it's in like nuts and seeds and whole grains. And it basically binds to iron and to calcium um, and to some other vitamins and minerals and makes it um, unusable for the body. And we know that iron is actually the number one um, vitamin or mineral deficiency worldwide. Mm. So here we are, we have a population that's eating less meat, eating a lot more grains. And so they're not getting enough vitamins and minerals and the vitamins and minerals they do get, they may not be able to utilize and absorb well. And then on the flip side of that, they are eating a lot more carbohydrates, probably, probably getting more blood sugar spikes and crashes, you know, um, it's interesting. I mean, anybody who's probably given a, a child a, a cookie or something, they can be Wah, euphoric and then crash. <laughs> and we're doing that, you know, often when we're eating all these carbohydrates and not, not getting enough protein and fat. It's impressive that um, I think parenting really helps you better understand the importance of nutrition because you do see the direct impact of like the foods that kids consume and their behavior right away. And then when you clean up their diet, it is really instantaneous. So yeah, I think um, there's, and I'm excited to 
dive into more of your book to help parents better understand this because um, parenting is hard enough as it is. You know, I mean, if you have a great, well-behaved kid, they still have kid issues and there's hormones and growth issues and socialization in school and screens and all the things. But um, seeing the be the direct behavior with uh, giving kids a lower carbohydrate diet, the evenness in the mood, um, better sleep, better, um, just more obedient and, and well-behaved, I think it's just profound. But um, yeah, I found, you know, with with the mental health component of that, with my former, you know, vegan clients, um, once they start eating a, a more omnivorous approach, it, it's like a, a very demonstrable change in their in their uh, mental well being. So I wanted to just kind of ask you personally before we get into kids, how long did you suffer from anxiety, and has that been pretty much resolved as a result of your diet change? Like, you know, there's obviously there's psychosocial issues, there's traumas, there's so many aspects of mental health, sure, right? Absolutely. But if you could weigh um, nutrition you know, with all of these different, you know, multifaceted approach, how much does nutrition change when it, when it comes to mental health, would you say? Oh my gosh. I, I wish I had known how, how much this would like changing how I ate changed my life. Like if you had told me, cause you know, I changed in 2019. If you had told me in 2018, like, Hey, you know what, if you change your diet, like it's going to like 360 your mental health. Yeah. I would, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, from, from the time I was even very young, you know, and certainly, you know, I was diagnosed, like I said, when I was 12 with anorexia, I had paralyzing anxiety. I mean, it affected every aspect of my life. I've often said that I felt like I was standing on the sidelines of my own life, you know, and I was constantly, kind of searching for things outside of my own self to make me feel good about myself, whether that was a relationship, whether that was my athletic performance, whether that was my academic performance. And I felt like when I was, when I changed how I ate, I not only just the, just felt more calm, but just more, I can't even describe it. It was, I was able to deal with life appropriately. Like, cause stress is, like you said, stress is going to happen. Like yeah. that's, that's, and you want stress. Stress can, can be a very good thing. But I just felt like I would crumble. Like I couldn't handle situations. I would call out of work with panic attacks. I was, you know, as a young person, I was married and divorced. I was financially broke. I had made a lot of really poor decisions. And once I was eating in a way that I felt like really aligned with my own human physiology, everything changed in my life. Like, and because my, you know, my brain and my body were able to function, I was able to you know, chase my passion. And that's kind of my mission in life. I think what most people want is they want to chase something that's important to them and they want to help and give back to the community. And that's like, that's all I've ever wanted to do. And, uh, but yeah, how, how different was it? I would say like, gosh, on a scale of one to 10, I mean, I was probably between an eight and a nine most days of like massive anxiety. And now I would say even on rough days, you know, where it's probably closer to like a three where I can be like, oh, that really sucks. But I'm, it doesn't ever stop me from doing something I want to do. Or like I said in the past, it was not overly uncommon to have to call out of work or, you know, have a blow up or, you know, engaged in some, some less than ideal, um, coping strategies. Yes. Coping strategies. Interesting that I think a lot of people need to hear that because, um, there was a recent statistic, I think 30% or more of women over 50 are on some sort of psych, whether it's an antipsychotic or an SSRI, mm -hmm. you know, it's very common, um, for uh, people to have mental health issues. And then you look at, you know, the diets that they're eating, right. We're, we're talking about, um, hyper palatable junk food, coping with wine, getting bad sleep. And so it's this vicious cycle and just changing this one thing, the primary foods that you eat, uh, and, and including exercise, I mean, it makes a massive difference. And I, I think it's just so important for people to understand that even there's um, different studies in inmates, violent inmates, if they look at the, the, uh, rate of their, or uh, sorry, the, if they quantify the omega-3 index, which is the amount of EPA, DHA, you mentioned DHA, really important for the brain. Um, that is correlated with the, why they were incarcerated in the first place where, yeah. you know, a lower omega-3 index is more strongly tethered to an incarceration based upon a committing a violent crime. And we're hearing so much about gun violence and all this, but why aren't we talking about, you know, just one aspect of it, the nutrition. Um, and, and like you mentioned, very few people, um, can convert, you know, um, uh, that it can make vitamin A, but also um, the linoleic acid in the diet, there's been studies show that down regulates the conversion from, you know, ALA to EPA and DHA. So having all these industrial seed oils and things like that, which I know is controversial as a, a dietitian, what is your stance on these uh, seed oils? I know there's a lot of polarizing information on the interwebs. How do you feel about that? 
I mean, I'm a huge advocate for animal fats. That's where we started, right? Like that's what humans, I believe, were most effectively to utilize process, you know, to for our bodies. Um, if somebody said, hey, I'm eating a tablespoon of mayonnaise a day, am I going to die? I'd say probably not. You know, I don't think that's what's what's killing people. But we, our consumption of seed oils hasn't just it has increased astronomically. Like the amount of like corn oil and canola oil isn't everything now. And so I think you have to actively go out of your way to, um, to really avoid those. And like I said, if you have, if you had something, you know, I, I, I feel a little different about seed oils than I do like sugars and things. I feel mm. like those are ubiquitous. We can directly tie those to d- disease. I've talked to many intelligent people and I, I understand both arguments about uh, for and against seed oils. So I tend to be a little more Switzerland on the seed oils. I still, for my own personal health, you know, I always lean to the animal fats cause I know those are good. And you know, they also come with some, some nutrition, but um, yeah, I mean, avoiding seed oil certainly isn't a bad idea. Right. But if there are a small amount of, say, sunflower oil and maybe something else, like I, I like like you said, I, I try to minimize these things, but they are. It's so easy to vilify certain things and have approach this through a binary lens. Um, but I do think for people, if you're consuming a lot of, of junk food, yeah. which is being promoted in the form of a plant-based diet. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, when they go vegan, they often start to have more. And various studies actually show this: more ultra-processed foods, and What's interesting, there was a recent commentary, I think you posted on this, I can't remember, I know a lot of people were sharing this article. Um, It was a review, I think, of the uh, dietary guidelines saying it's okay to eat hyper palatable processed food so long as they are plant-based, right? Or something to that effect. Sponsored by the plant-based food company. Yeah, what do you think about that? I think that's ridiculous, yeah. You know, and it's, I think you, once again, coming back to common sense, like, okay, if I'm not eating meat and fat, which is very calorie dense, which is very, you know, highly dense in nutrients and protein and, you know, a lot of things my body needs, well, what else am I eating? You know, on a vegan diet, I, I can't just eat salad or vegetables. I, I need, you know, I need calories. I need substance. I need nutrition. And so I'm going to be either eating a lot of whole food based carbohydrates, um, which in and itself probably isn't great for most of our population, considering they're already hyperglycemic, or I'm going to be eating these ultra processed carbohydrates, which is a terrible thing. I think ultra processed carbohydrates are rightfully vilified by many mm-hmm. just because of not only what they do to your blood sugar giving you that you know spike in glucose then ultimate crash but you know it was dr george e that first showed me some evidence that those can actually alter the um, neurotransmitters in your brain you know and obviously we know you get a rush of dopamine but can actually alter like gaba and glutamate um to levels that we see in like suicide victims and people that have you know been in like traumatic accidents like actually elevating them to these really high levels that your brain's not supposed to be at so well, so if we were talking like maybe having a pop tart or something like that mm-hmm. that will change the expression of these critically important inhibitory neurotransmitters Yes. And it was, and it was a study that was done, um, like over time. Mm. So I, I don't know, I, I would imagine that it wasn't like, Hey, I had something once, but right. unfortunately most of society is eating these things every Habitually, single day. I was, yeah. I shouldn't be, but I was shocked at the number of people who ate fast food every day. Statistically, I want to say it's like over 50% of yeah. the, <laughs> like, holy cow. Um, yeah. What it actually was doing was it was, um, shifting glutamate and GABA. It was like kind of pedal to the metal of glutamate specifically. Um, and what that potentially was doing was altering your, uh, the brain's ability to engage in neuroplasticity and, you know, your brain needs to be able to engage in neuroplasticity to, to mold, to change. And so I found it really interesting that, you know, spe- especially with people dealing with like addictions and eating disorders, it's like, we're asking you to, to change behavior, to change how you think, to, to change your ways. But then we're, they're often eating these foods that may potentially be preventing their brains from molding and changing and taking in new information. That is so wild. Yeah. The, the, uh, BDNF goes down with depression and things like that. So it's really important, um, to be able to have, uh, the ability to create and grow new neurons and not be stuck in these, these mental loops and patterns, which can, um, become more fostered when people are in an anxious, you know, hyper excitable state, you know, it's more easy to get into that panic mindset and, and, and things like that. I think it's really fascinating, but, uh, I want to, uh, sorry, I keep going back to protein because there's a lot of concerns about protein. What about the microbiome and short chain fatty acids and TMAO, trimethylamine oxide? People are very concerned about this. I uh, kind of got into health through the lens of the microbiome and things like that through functional medicine training. Are you concerned about the long-term gut health on a high protein animal-based diet? 
I'm not, no, I'm not at all. No. And you know, the, the micro, like if anybody ever says like, this is what you should eat for an ideal microbiome, or that's what you should eat. Like, I wouldn't necessarily believe them because honestly, we don't know. We don't want to have really good data on what exactly is the quote unquote perfect microbiome. And we know that it changes when you change what you eat, Mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, from my, my experience with people eating a lot of protein, um, and even people on these very high fat ketogenic diets, they have pretty good alpha diversity of their microbiome compared to just somebody eating a regular whatever diet. So, um, yeah, I'm not concerned at all. And once again, I would just ask people like, Hey, you know, let's go back to, um, you know, like the Maasai in Kenya or the nude Eskimos that just eat like you know, the, the new, they just seal blubber. They eat mostly, it's like over 80% fat. It's almost like a ketogenic diet. And then the Maasai, it's, you know, a lot of blood, milk, beef, and, um, they do fine. <laughs> they have like zero, you know, rates of chronic disease. And it's really not until, unfortunately, we introduce processed foods into those cultures that they seem to have issues. So yeah, I am, I'm not worried about humans eating a large amount of a food that we evolved and thrived eating. I agree. And I, I think what's interesting about that is, it's more important, I think, to look at body composition and mental health. So it's hard sure. to make the argument, you know, the microbiome, it seems um, so ephemeral and hard to really pinpoint which, you know, species is favorable versus not, the firmicutes versus bacteroides ratio, all these things are constantly changing. And, you know, I think, you know, as long as, like you said, your CBC, your, your common Chem24 with lipids and hemoglobin, if all those things are turning in the right directions. Your mental health is improving. Your body composition is changing. Your, all of these, how can you make the argument that that is harmful <laughs> for your health? I mean, that's what it, I think it, common yeah, sense. Well, just, and I'll tell you a story. So, you know, like after I changed how I ate, so I was still working in, in the hospital setting, you know, and I went from, I'm never going to run again, you know, paralyzing anxiety, missing work. Life honestly was a little bit of a mess to... I my, had no anxiety. I was looking forward to going to work. I was able to not only start running again, but I started training for a, a six hour race and like everything in my life was better. Mm. I was happy. And it was, um, I want to say about six months into this, one of the dietitians that I was working with, I said, Hey, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. Yeah. What's going on? And she said, you know, all that, all that beef and butter you're eating is really bad for your heart. And this particular dietitian, um, and I'm not fat shaming anybody, I'm just stating facts, is probably about 5'2", 240. And it was amazing, the cognitive dissonance there. Like, she's looking at me, and I mean, she probably didn't know all the mental struggle and other things that I've had, but it literally was like, I shifted every, everything in my life was better. I was happy, I was running, I ended up running and winning that six hour race. And she just, she was so sure that the way I was eating was harmful. And that the way that she was eating, you know, a lot of salads and bagels and things was good. And that's what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. So I think people sometimes, um, I don't know, maybe can't see the forest through the trees, right? Like they just, they get so fixated on this, this dogma and these things that they've heard over and over again, or just what culture says, or their friend on Facebook says, or whatever, that they stop like, once I'm just going to come back to it, common sense, critical thinking, you know, and even just ask like, Oh, Hey, wow, Michelle, you seem a lot happier. Your training's going well, you know, just I, I, one thing that I think is a strength of mine is I'm okay saying, I don't know. Yeah. I'm okay. Growing, evolving, changing, you know, where I think some people get so stuck and they're just have a really hard time saying, Oh, I'm wrong. You know? And I also think for dietitians, like I worked with a woman when we lived in Colorado who had been working as 35 years. So if she's going to change how she, practices she's going to have to admit that what she's been teaching for 35 years is wrong and i think that's really hard for people to do too totally hard uh, it's very very challenging and there's a lot of cognitive biases that, that go into that but um this is going to sound insensitive of me to say this but we had talked about this offline and i think it needs to be said if that dietitian colleague of yours was let's just say 130 pounds was as fit as you you would probably be like, you know what, maybe like, can you show me the research that you're using to say that this high fat, high protein diet is problematic, but because we do look uh, at people's body composition and things like that, when, when, and you talked about this, your life gets better when you lose weight, you know? So I think that is a reminder for people like, you know, your body composition says a lot about um, who you are as a person and your uh, delaying gratification and your habits. And you have a little bit more credibility when you speak to other people. And, and I'm not trying to fat shame or vilify people or say, you know, they're unworthy of, of, of things, but I think it is helpful for people to realize that um, when you are healthy, people take you more seriously. Absolutely. Like, you know, I, I think I, 
I can speak on, you know, like ultra running because I ultra run, like I can speak um, on, you know, eating the higher, higher fat, high protein diet, low carb, because I've done that. Right. So certainly, you know, your credibility um, changes when you, you're actually living a certain situation. And I, I think, you know, I, sometimes in society, I feel like we see a pendulum shift, you know, and, and, it, and sometimes it needs to, you know, it needs to shift um, when it comes to we have any discrimination or other other issues like that. But then it, sometimes it shifts too far. <laughs> and, you know, I often say, you know, I see a lot of people, um, you know, the, the fat acceptance movement, you know, being metabolically unhealthy is not it's not great. That's not, you know, it doesn't, once again, like you said, this isn't fat shaming. It doesn't make you a bad person. But sometimes I think like, my God, when I was five feet tall and 57 pounds, I'm really glad somebody didn't say like, Oh, she's just thin. You know, yeah, <laughs> like okay. nobody said like, Hey, you're a bad person. And they said, Hey, you're, you're going to, you're going to die if you keep going this way. Like you need help, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think I, I would love to see society move more in that direction to where we say like, Hey, how can we support you? You know, it's wild to me that, you know, it's like the, show my 600 pound life like our society has decided that once people get that large our tax dollars will pay for them to go on disability and they can just keep eating how they want and we'll give them insulin and medications versus like why don't we as a society say like we will we recognize that you're valuable and important we will pay to help you get help we will pay to help you lose weight we will pay to ensure that you're following a diet that's going to align with your physiology like it just it blows my mind yeah, I think tax incentives for, you know, a hemoglobin A1C target under 5.5 maybe or a body composition, body fat percentage under 20. I mean, that would be enticing for people. If you could save $5,000 a year on your federal taxing, you know, form Absolutely. by just showing that you are under 20% body fat or whatever, 22%. We can raise the bar a little bit. That would be, I think, in, insightful for a lot of people and they are, they would kind of decide, well, hey, is it really worth an extra 5K a year to um, go to fast food, you know, half the, half of my, for half of my meals? I mean, it was incredible during COVID. I mean, you know, and I talk about COVID a lot because there was a lot of people that focused ostensibly on their health, but by masking and distancing, but then the fast food drive throughs were like the longest I've ever seen them. And I was like, wow, there, there's a real big disconnect here. So we're seeing this through different domains of health, which is interesting. But another domain of health that I talk a lot about is exercise. So I, I kind of want to finish off... Um, this conversation, which has been great, by the way, with what do you do pre-workouts? You're doing ultra endurance events. Uh, these are very taxing on the body, especially running on the musculoskeletal system. Um, and you're doing this in a low carb state most of the time or? Oh yeah, okay. I would say. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I went from, I used to be, or I wanted to be like a elite marathon runner and now I do the ultra and ultra is just defined as anything greater than a marathon. And so what my goal is during ultra running is I want to be able to oxidize and utilize as much fat uh, for fuel as possible. Um, because we never run out of stored body fat, you know, even super duper lean, like the elite Kenyan runners you'll see out there probably have enough stored body fat to run. I forget statistically, but several marathons back to back to back. But I mean, obviously you'd have muscle fatigue and other factors. So, you know, every endurance athlete, it doesn't matter if you're high carb, low carb, our goal is to defend muscle glycogen. And so by training and living in a way to where I'm eating, you know, a low carbohydrate diet, I'm teaching my body to burn fat for fuel. And so by being very effective at doing that, I am preserving my muscle glycogen. I'm not utilizing as much um, muscle and liver gly glycogen, even at a faster pace and a higher heart rate. And to kind of um, give an example, so like, let's say if I was a really high carbohydrate athlete and I'm running a, a 50 mile race, I might need, I don't know, um, 40 to 80 grams of carbohydrates every hour. Yeah. Well, because I am a lower carbohydrate athlete, I'm able to get away with 20 to 25 grams of carbohydrates an hour. So I don't need as much carbohydrates. Um, I'm not going to potentially have as much stomach distress. That's a lot of sugar <laughs> every hour. Um, I'm going to recover. At least this has been my experience from doing the high carb to low carb. I recover faster. Um, I sleep better. And yeah, I just, I just feel much more consistent. You know, I'm not finishing runs, feeling dizzy and shaky. Gosh, when I was a marathon runner, I used to, I might do a long run on a Saturday or Sunday and I was just wiped out. You know, I'd come home and I was just worthless. <laughs> and now like, you know, a Saturday I did uh, 21 miles and then, 
you know, came home and um, mowed the lawn. You know, I always, I try to say I'm too sore to mow the lawn. It never works. <laughs> I don't like mowing the lawn. No, but I get to, you know, hang out and do things with my wife, walk my dog. And then the next day I came back and I did um, an hour and 45 up tempo. So, you know, doing like 7.30 pace. For, and so, and that would have never happened when I was a higher carb athlete. I'm just much um, able to recover quite a bit better. But then I do use carbs. This is where it gets a little confusing. Some people are like, yeah. oh, you're a zero carb athlete. No, nobody, no person who's trying to win races is a zero carb we're just using them like like zach bitter does this as well we're using them strategically you know we're using them um i, I won't have carbohydrates before starting an event you know i don't want to get that insulin response but once you start running about 40 to 45 minutes in having those carbohydrates you don't get that same impact because you, you know you got your heart rate up um and so yeah that's that's kind of how i've structured my my nutrition and it's of your belief that because your baseline level of inf inflammation is lower, that perhaps your recovery is better. I mean, if you could kind of explain to me, and I, I've dove into this, and I personally, by the way, adhere to the same premise and principles that you do. And and I'm not um, a ultra runner, but my daughter and I, for context, Saturday evening, we did a four mile bike ride and then a, um, into a hike that was four miles and then came back and we we're you know, did that within 12 hours and then camped up there in the high country and then came back down and we both did a bunch of other stuff in the afternoon. We're totally fine, right? Awesome. Uh, we're not exhausted. I'm fine today. In contrast, if I were to do that carb loading and all this, I would feel like bloated and gassy mm -hmm. and like, oh, I have to have four bowel movements because of all the carbs I ate. So I feel that my baseline level of inflammation is lower, but I would love to know what you think because you're, you know, oxidizing more fats for fuel. Is that what you think your, your recovery is just better or? Yeah, it's really, I wish there was some really good data on why this is. Cause I have people ask me like, what, what is the mechanism? And I don't think we have really good data. There was one study that showed that, um, and I put this in my book, The Dietitian's Dilemma, that people on low carbohydrate uh, diets, endurance athletes, I believe it was cyclists, had less inflammation, like less muscle inflammation. But once again, like why? I don't think we exactly know. I don't know whether it's just the whole process of utilizing all those carbohydrates is potentially more inflammatory. Is it we're getting more vitamins and minerals with more protein or more fat? I, I honestly, I don't know, but I, 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 I would agree with you that I have experienced, and I've heard this from many athletes that go, um, lower carb. But I would also say to you that, you know, it, it is a process. You mm -hmm. know, when I, when I first went low carb, I wasn't running at all. You know, I didn't run for like a month. And when I first started, you know, decided to, to run again, it was pretty humbling. <laughs> it was pretty slow. You know, it takes your body a while to adjust, uh, to, to lower, to lower carbs. So it's not like, Oh wow, I have a big race coming up. I'm going to try low carb. I wouldn't, I would do, if someone's interested in utilizing that strategy, I would definitely do it in like the off season and give mm -hmm. your, give your body plenty of time to adjust. Yeah. There's a book by Travis Christofferson called The Fourth Fuel, and he talks a lot about how NAD and NADPH and the uh, mitochondrial cofactors and, and coenzymes involved in metabolism are upregulated when we're eating a lower carbohydrate diet. And as a function of that, we have better redox to oxidative stress balance and so forth. So if we are athletic uh, and we're primarily oxidizing fats for fuel because we're st strategically utilizing carbohydrates around intense or prolonged exercise and not so much for just mundane training events that our baseline level of free radical stress would be lower. So he gets into that. So if people want to dive into more of the mechanisms, I thought that was a really phenomenal book and he gets into Veach's work and, and even Otto Warburg and oh, all wow. of that. Yeah, it's really cool. That's cool. But um, it is interesting. Just the the level of recovery is just much faster. I would so say so much better, and it's it's almost hard to describe like just how much better it is. Like being, I mean, like I said, you know, I I would do twenty miles and just be out for the day, where it's like I'm able to come home, do some stuff, wake up the next day, and train again. So it definitely has. Um, it's it's allowed me to increase my training load too, That's which awesome. is pretty awesome. That's amazing, and yeah, volume is key towards these adaptations. You know, yeah. especially in your yeah. It, training category. Um, now strategically cycling in the carbs. Okay. So you said you would start out an event. What's your next event for context? Like, what Oh yeah, it? I'm going to be doing, um, the tunnel hill 50 mile race. That's uh, November 11th. Okay. So it's coming up the rate it's, it's the morning of the race. When you're eating this way, by the way, you don't have to worry about the, the porta potty. I mean, if <laughs> anyone has done an endurance event, like the, there's a line for the porta potty because people are having bagels and orange juice and all this and they're yes. having the squirts and it's bad, right? So you don't have to worry about that, which is nice. Um, what are you going to have bef like for breakfast that day? 
Um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm a creature of habit. Like I usually almost every morning before I run, I'm just having, um, coffee with either coconut oil or heavy cream. And then for something like that, that's a little bit longer. Like if I was just going on an hour run, that might just be it. Um, I'm just doing some source of fat, like whether that's like a nut butter or a little bit more, um, coconut oil. Like I'm not having really any substance, you know, certainly the days leading up to that, I might eat a little bit more, um, just food in general, but I'm going to be starting, um, you know, my, my body is going to be pretty much glycogen stocked, you know, mm-hmm. because my training will have decreased and I'll, you know, I don't, it's not carb loading for say, but I'll probably make sure I have between 75 and hundred grams of carbs the days leading up versus just like, you know, 50 or something a little bit lower. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's really, you know, most people, like you said, people are getting pancakes, all these big breakfasts and it's like, I'm having maybe a couple hundred calories. Um, but yeah, then when we, when we get into it, um, you know, I really don't think what you have during a, a run, like what type of carbohydrate you have, if you're a lower carbohydrate human matters too much. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and I've tried different things. Sometimes I have just white rice. I've used a product by S fuels. I've used just some of the regular gels. Um, and you know, not obviously not something I would have <laughs> all, the time. all the time, but you know, your goal on race day is just to run as fast as possible. But yeah, yeah. whatever kind of combination gets me about 20, 25 to 30 grams of carbs an hour is usually kind of what I, what okay. I try to hit. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, even something like a banana or dried fruit or whatever, I mean, whatever it is, especially on a race day. Um, but, but the carb loading to sort of replenish your glycogen store, I think there's a big, a lot of misconceptions around that. People would carb load the night before, whereas science really shows, I mean, if you want to replenish glycogen, you should do it after your last workout, not like the right before a lot of that can be converted to fat, you know? So. Exactly. Yeah. Cause right after you're, you know, you're, you're worked out, you've worked out, especially if it was a more higher intensity, um, is when you're, you know, muscle cells and everything are most adequately going to be able to utilize glycogen. If you do it like the night before we were just sitting there, <laughs> you feel lethargic. Yeah, and- you feel kind of crappy. You don't sleep very well, you know? So I always thought that was funny. We went um, two years ago, my wife and I went to tunnel Hill. I, I ran the 50 mile there and, uh, yeah, everybody's eating pasta and, mm-hmm. you know, they had a big thing, um, you know, cakes and all this stuff. And we had, we had already eaten, you know, we'd brought our burger patties and stuff. So, but it's, you know, that that's still pervasive that you need lots and lots of carbohydrates, you know, the, the night before the day before where it's just, that's kind of silly. Like you said, most of that's probably just going to be converted to fat. Right. And how would you say the body composition of yourself would be in contrast to your peers that you're competing against? Would you say that you have less overall body fat and particularly like abdominal obesity, mm-hmm. um, more muscle mass? I mean, I just say this anecdotally, I noticed when I was doing a lot of, um, endurance racing, competitive cycling, specifically in Colorado in the pro one, two category, a lot of elite cyclists, you know, I noticed as the season went on, they, they started to get more of a gut, you know, cause mm-hmm. you know, this carb loading thing kind of creates its own eating disorder of itself because your, your life revolves around food as an endurance a- athlete. And, um, I got into the paleo diet for athletes by Lauren Codain back then. And Boyd Eaton had, had done a lot of early work there. So anyway, the point being that I would get leaner, it, they would, their body composition would shift. And I'm like, this is really bizarre. Yeah. So have you noticed that just amongst your peers? Um, you know, it's interesting. I definitely noticed, um, I noticed, and I think it's different with like, like super elite marathoners and people I still are, are very lean, you mm-hmm. know, but the, that one to 2% of the field, but a lot of people who are competing even in ultras or uh, marathons specifically, I remember standing with my wife watching a marathon. I'm like, there's a lot of fat people running. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying once again to be fat shaming or anything, but you know, you would, you would think like, okay, somebody's training, you know, that even if they're running 30, 40 miles a week they should be relatively lean. I actually worked with a woman once who said like, I'm running 50 miles a week and I can't lose weight. She's like, I'm training for a marathon. And we went over what she was eating and it's like, well, you know, she'd go, she'd have a granola bar and then go run. And then she, as soon as she was done, she'd have cereal and pancakes, you know, sandwich for lunch, pasta for dinner. It's like, you're constantly secreting insulin. You're constantly telling your body to store fat for fuel. So all we did was basically switch it like, hey, we're going to get you to where before you run, especially easy runs, we're just going to do some fat, you know, we're going to get you carbohydrates right after you run. But that's, that's our main focus. The rest of the time we're doing more protein and fat. And, you know, within a few months, like leaned out, felt better. So it's like, wow, I had no idea. Like we just, we don't tell people how powerful carbohydrates are when it comes to storing fat. So yeah, are they, are they necessary a tool or can they be? Absolutely. But also, like you said, if you're, if they're not used correctly, if you're constantly eating them and not doing much. And I would also imagine, you know, as you get older and as like hormones change, you know, there's, there's things that you can get away with when you're in high school and college. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Good Lord. We had a lot of crap in college, you know, that 
when you're thirties and forties, you're gonna, it's gonna just cause you to store body fat. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Okay. So Michelle, we've been talking a lot about metabolic health and how about 96% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. We know muscle is a key organ that's tethered to metabolic health. A lot of people are under muscled and that, uh, you know, we talk about this in jargonistic terms is characterized as sarcopenia. You talk a lot about this in your book, Dietitian's Dilemma about sarcopenia. What would you like folks to know about the prevalence of sarcopenia and then some of the best ways to prevent it? Yeah. So, you know, especially it was really interesting to me, you know, I think a lot of people when they picture somebody who's old, like immediately they picture somebody who's kind of frail, you know, and what I saw in the hospital more often than not, what, and of course that, you know, you saw people who were frail, but I saw a lot of sarcopenic obesity, meaning people who had so little muscle, but so much fat, they literally could not get up to use the bathroom. Like they were bed bound or they were wheelchair bound. And we know statistically when people are older, if they have a fall, you know, they're, they're much less likely to recover. And, you know, our, our protein recommendations in general are just, are laughable. Like they're, they're too low for the general population. But as you get older, your body's ability to utilize and synthesize protein decreases. And so we actually need more protein as we get older. And it becomes doing any type of resistance activity becomes exponentially important. You know, I've seen, you know, people even once again in their forties that are just are weak, that can't walk well, that are bed bound. But then you've also seen people who are in their nineties, you know, we know throughout history, people, you know, old people would hunt and fish and do all kinds of things, but that requires two things that requires you have enough amino acids, right? So you have to have enough protein that also requires that you're stressing your muscles. You have to move. You know, that's one thing, um, even before I became a low carb athlete and really got interested in this subject, people used to say like, what's, what's one of the most important things in nutrition. And I would say, don't stop moving mm -hmm. like that. That is key. That's amazing. And so when it comes to preventing sarcopenia and muscle loss, we talk about exercise, like you just emphasized mm -hmm. eloquently, but then there's the other side and, and amino acids and protein, um, where do you weight those or do we go about this concomitantly prioritizing protein and the exercise element? Because again, there's all these fears about protein, <laughs> especially as people get older. I find, uh, especially with my parents too, it's like vegetable soups, it's salads, yeah. you know, there's this fear about protein, protein and cancer and all this. So what, I mean, like you said, as you get older, you need more protein. You need more protein. And then you, you made some good points that some major issues that, you know, I, I saw in the hospital and we see in our elderly people is one, a lot of time they have really poor dentition, meaning they, they can't chew things well. Um, and then their appetite decreases. And so, you know, it could, breakfast might be toast and tea, lunch is soup, dinner is cheese and crackers or, you know, something like that. And so, you know, you, days upon days upon days, you have people getting minimal protein. We're talking 20, 30 grams, maybe a day, where in reality, you know, these people might need 1.2 grams plus per kilo, one point, they might need, you know, 80, 90 grams of protein. And, um... Gosh, I, I, I was trying to, as you're saying that, I was like, gosh, I don't know which one is more important. I would say they, the research would say it's co-committed. They're, they're, they're both equally important. Cause if you're sitting, if you're literally doing, oh, I don't want to move. You're doing nothing but eating a bunch, <laughs> yeah, protein, a bunch of protein, like you're not going to stimulate muscle growth, you know, but if you're doing a lot of resistance training and not getting those amino acids, you're just going to continue to break down the muscle mass that you have. Yeah. So, and then I think people too, like just the idea of exercise or resistance training really freaks people out. Like, oh, I, I've never been to the gym. You know, I had a really great example of this woman that I, I got to see um, in the hospital setting. She was in uh, rehab and not, not like drug and alcohol rehab, but like you've been in an accident and you're mm -hmm. in the hospital for like six months. And she was, she, she was an elderly woman, but she was committed. She was just, you know, lifting like first it was just soup cans. And then she worked up to like five pound weights and he was doing things with her legs. And, you know, it, it was one of those people that was just really determined. She, she hadn't really poor appetite, but she would eat eggs in the morning. She'd have a protein shake at lunch. She'd always have some meat for dinner. And she walked out of there. She walked out of the hospital after a major accident where sometimes, like I was saying, people might be wheelchair bound. So, yeah. you know, it, um, it can be done. It can be done for sure. That is amazing. And so for those people, would you recommend in terms of their protein sources, eggs, beef, things like that, like, you know, making it um, tasty, but also easily digestible. I love red meat, right? But some people don't like yeah. red meat. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of elderly people, once again, just even with chewing, you know, could be could be difficult. So yeah, what what do you like? That's what I would say. What do you like? What is easy to chew? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's why I also I would never just write a meal plan for some people will be like, Oh, can you just write me a meal plan? I'm like, I need to find out what you enjoy. Yeah. So I think any type of animal protein is good, you know, and oftentimes too, people associate like, uh, oh, I have to have chicken or fish and it's just super bland. It's like, let's make it with a, a sauce, a tallow, a butter, something that makes it kind of unctuous and soft. So by doing that, you know, and, and something like eggs, it's really soft cottage cheese, um, you know, even, you know, I'm, I, I always want people to eat real food, but if you have, you know, a protein shake or yogurt with added some added protein, like once a day, I mean, that's so much better than not, not getting the protein for sure. I love that. I mean, you can flavor up. I often like us, instead of having ice cream, we'll have some uh, blueberries, frozen blueberries, some whole unpasteurized yogurt and just some whey protein. And it tastes phenomenal. It's very satiating, very filling. Uh, and it satisfies that little sweet tooth that can happen to all of us, which I think is, is amazing. Amazing. Uh, I, since we talked about sarcopenia and protein, I, we have to talk a little bit about fasting. You know, fasting sure. is so popular now and people are compressing their feeding windows and, you know, we focus so much on fat and fat oxidation, which is great. But what about the muscle when we're just fasting extendedly uh, for extended periods of time? You know, what, how do you view fasting now in light of the importance of muscle and preventing sarcopenia? Yeah, well, you know, I think fasting, fasting too is, is very, um, I don't want to say case by case basis because I, I feel like we have some really good evidence just how important it is to give your body a break from eating. You know, I definitely think there are certain situations where fasting may not be ideal. You know, obviously if you're severely underweight, if you're, you know, like for me as someone who's like an endurance athlete, it may not be ideal. But, um, you know, if somebody... If you are fasting, I do think it's important that you're getting protein those several times a day. You know, I'm not a fan of somebody who's just, you know, saying like, oh, I'm only eating like once a day. I think we have enough evidence and Dr. Gabriel Lyon has talked about this, that it's important to, to spread out, you know, getting enough amino acids several times a day. Um, but I do also I really appreciate and just validate how, like we talked about earlier, that the Americans are eating and probably everyone now across the world so many times throughout the day that that's, it's even challenging for our mitochondria just to keep up. Like with, you know, it'd be like, I always say it's like an employee that like, you know, this poor employee is trying to do a report and you're like constantly giving them more work, more work, more work. They're like, ah, I just can't do it. You know, give them a break, give your body a, a time to rest and to heal. It's kind of like that rest and digest. Right. So, um, yeah, I guess when it comes to protein intake, you know, if you are eating in a specific window, say you only eat, I don't know, eight hours, six hours, whatever that is, I would make sure that you're, you're prioritizing protein for sure. And how many meals a day are you eating? Generally? I eat three meals a day. Okay. Yeah. I generally eat three meals a day. Sometimes, gosh, if I have like a really long run, like for example, um, you know, Saturday where I might be going to a trail and then running. I mean, I may not get home to like one or two, then I might only eat two meals a day and they might be larger, but just to get enough calories, um, you know, and I've, I've experimented with different stuff, but it's hard for me to eat more than about a thousand calories in a city. I know Zach, my, my running coach can do that. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I think most people ate two to three times. And even maybe if you're somebody who's been eating a lot of carbs and you're, you're dealing with hyper or hypoglycemia, maybe you need to kind of like kind of ease into it. But I think if everybody only ate three meals, <laughs> we, we would a be a healthier problems. society and really just prioritized, you know, protein and fat. Yeah, I agree. But, yeah. uh, you have, you have the book out right now, Dietitian's Dilemma, and then a new book. Do you want to let folks know where they can find yeah. and learn more about that? I appreciate that. So yeah, The Dietitian's Dilemma, um, you know, I wrote that after I got my health back and I really wanted to speak on a few disease states that I felt like not only did we have the evidence, really good evidence, but also I had experience with. So it talks about how a low carb, high fat animal based diet can potentially reverse, you know, type two diabetes, mental health disorders, including like bipolar disorder, a schizophrenia, a schizoaffective disorder, um, eating disorders, which of course is very controversial, um, heart disease and sarcopenia. You know, we didn't talk, uh, we could talk for hours and hours. Um, also talks a little bit about running because people were just, a lot of people reached out to me and were kind of curious, like, oh, how are you feeling you're running? Um, and, you know, shares my personal story. And, uh, yeah, and so the new book is it's actually a children's book. So it's called The Fox Family Food Fight. Um, I was inspired by uh, the FDA coming out with two medications for children with type 2 diabetes. I was on a run and I was just so angry because it was like, God, only in America do we have a problem and we create another problem for the problem. And I'm not anti-medication, but it was like we, we can't throw medications at our children without teaching them how to eat in a way to lower their blood sugar. Like it just seemed so backwards. 
And so it's with, it's with cartoon foxes. It's fun. It has a lot of alliteration and basically the, you know, the take home message, you know, I would hope kids would read it and be like, Oh, hooray, you know, little Freddie Fox. He ends up getting type two Fox diabetes, uh, has to go to the Fox hospital and he sees the Fox edition. Um, so I, you know, I hope kids read it and they get excited about it. I hope adults read it and say like, Oh man, you know, processed food, we, we gotta, we gotta eat whole foods. We can't be eating processed foods all the time, but that should be out in late October. So it is, it is almost done. It's, it's been a really fun project to work on. That's amazing. And as we've been talking about, I mean, it's definitely much needed, you know, the, the ultra processed food, uh, consumption rates are about 61% in children. I mean, this was, I think, was it Journal of the American Medical Association or someone recently, it was last fall, 2022, looked at this and then mm-hmm. NPR reported on it. Uh, it's, it's astounding what is fed to children in schools. That's um, horrible. Yeah, so I think it's much needed, which is great. And then it helps the parents, especially if one spouse is on board. This is what I found in my, you know, just my life. Like one sport, one spouse gets it, usually mom, and dad is like, eh, it's no big deal. And, and so getting both parents on board is, I think, amazing. So Absolutely. hopefully that book will help. Yeah. And just the goal too, like, can we get kids to eat more? If we can get kids to eat more protein, more fat, and like you said, even just having, having a guard, having things that kids get more involved in, I think makes it, is going to make a huge difference. So, and just kind of getting kids to kind of wrap their heads around like what they eat really impacts how they feel. You know, my, my nephew, he's actually type one diabetic. So he's had the continuous glucose monitor, um, since he was much younger and, you know, he, he can tell not only like by how he feels, but just by, you know, what his numbers say, like, oh, wow, I feel so much better when I eat this versus this. So yeah, hopefully we can, you know, we, it's such an uphill battle with us versus processed foods. But, you know, I think by continuing to advocate, continuing to, you know, get the word out, you know, we're going to, we're going to make some change. I love it. I hope, I hope we do. And, and your book will help with that. So Thank Michelle, you. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I know you're big on Instagram. Do you do YouTube videos as well? If people want to connect with you, where should they look? Yeah. At you? you know, I'm mostly active on Instagram. So it's at run, eat, meet, repeat. Um, nice. you know, do some posts on there. We actually, my wife and I do some videos, uh, making fun of nice. <laughs> certain I things that. that are happening. Um, yeah, the dietitians dilemma.net is my website, but yeah, you can reach out through the website. You can reach out through Instagram. I'm also on Mich- uh, Twitter at Michelle Hearn RD. Amazing.